morning, everybody. This morning we are joined by Dr. David Keegan, who is um, an ophthalmologist in the Matter Hospital in Dublin. Um, great to have you on board, Dr. Keegan, and thanks for coming back to have a chat with us this morning. Great. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for having me back. Great, great. I suppose it's important to, to have you back just because now that we have um, reached the point where the strict lockdown of COVID-19 has um, passed and that the restrictions are beginning to ease, I think it's very important for listeners to understand how the delivery of eye health care services in hospitals will be occurring. So um, I suppose just without further ado, if we can um, ask you to tell us what's been happening about delivering ongoing treatments such as AMD injections in your hospital during the COVID lockdown and go, looking forward, what are the plans for ensuring all services are reinstated over the next few months? Uh, thank you, June. I think the first thing to say is I hope everybody's uh, keeping well, looking after their physical and their mental health through all of this. It's very challenging and uh, they're to mind themselves and to mind each other. Um, what I would like to say is that we at the Matter Hospital, indeed any of the eye units around the country, have continued to deliver service for those in most need over the period of lockdown and that has not stopped albeit in a scaled back manner that I alluded to in the first of these podcasts a number of weeks ago. What we are now looking at doing is really how we deliver service alongside COVID-19 in a safe and efficient manner. So to do that, we are starting to relax some of those restrictions and increase the footfall through the hospital in a safe way. What we've managed to do over the last couple of weeks is to rearrange our hospitals and our units that we can bring more people through in a safe, socially distant manner throughout their journey into the hospital. And as such, we've all looked at our injection facilities and I've been in touch with colleagues across the country and they've all attained the similar um, goal of managing to do that. And we ourselves are looking to increase our injection capacity from a region of about 30 to 40 percent that we had been doing through lockdown, closer to 80 and 90 percent and back up to 100 percent towards the end of the year. So patients who had been on injection schedule should expect to get contacted by the hospital in the coming weeks to be rescheduled for their injections to come in. We will ask those patients to attend for their appointments at their allotted time, not hour beforehand, and that they come for as much as possible on their own uh, without an attending uh, person. And we will get the patients through in a more efficient manner. This is one of the areas that we've looked at in our hospitals about delivery of care is the pathways patients take within hospital and make sure that they're only in the hospital for the amount of time that they actually need to be and there'll be less hanging around. So with all these systems in place we hope to really get these urgent treatments back up and running in the next couple of weeks and patients will get back on their injection schedules uh, in all their hospitals. And what you're describing there Dr Keegan are scheduled appointments but obviously urgent interventions happen in as well as uh, kind of emergency eye care services are needed. So what happens in emergency situations? Yes, we've continued to deliver sort of urgent care for things like retinal detachments and glaucoma over the course of it. And we do stress to people if you have a sudden symptomatic change in your vision or your visual status, please contact your eye unit, your general practitioner, are the opticians, the optometrists who are now open again from Monday the 18th of May and have an assessment and then an onward referral if it's deemed necessary. While the units are not taking walk-in referrals for urgent cases, there are efficient email and phone services that are listed on the websites of all the hospitals and eye units around the country and I believe the NCBI have these up on their website also for people to reference. True. We do, we do have the, it's under the uh, frequently asked questions list. We have the list of telephone numbers for all the um, eye health clinics right across the country. Um, I suppose if someone is concerned that their sight has deteriorated over the past few months, is there anything in addition to what you've just mentioned there that they should do? And if they have never attended a hospital before and they did feel their vision has deteriorated, they should attend a general practitioner or their optometrist uh, to get a referral into the eye unit and we will see them in either eye emergency department if it's that urgent or in one of our scheduled clinics which are getting back on track also. If they are one of our existing patients they could, should contact the eye unit themselves 
and see if an appointment can be arranged for them in the coming weeks. Okay, that's um, very clear for patients. Um, but <clears throat> what are the symptoms or telltale signs that someone's vision is deteriorating? But usually it's the, it's the classic features that yeah, things look a little bit more blurred, uh, the television looks more blurred or faces look more blurred or things are distorted where you might see a straight pole that it looks uh, wobbled or misshapen and that can indicate a macular condition. So if you get a sudden change that you can't see the television or faces clearly or there's a distorted image, you should contact us. And remember, the commonest cause of people's vision deteriorating is cataract. That usually happens slowly uh, over time and it's not an urgent referral. OK, that's very reassuring. Um, and I, I, I suppose another concern that people might have is that there might be a influx of new patients seeking a diagnosis or treatment um, into ophthalmology services because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Do you share that concern? I do share that concern. I think across all of medicine, we realise there's a lot of pent up uh, disease that's been developing in people during the lockdown. We know that attendances to general practitioners and to general emergency departments have, have reduced over this period of time. People are adhering to the strict lockdown rules and they're also concerned about contracting the virus themselves. So we do think that with the loosening of restrictions next week, particularly for ourselves with optometrists reopening, that we will have a number of patients coming in looking for um, uh, treatments and diagnoses <clears throat> for certain eye conditions. We have uh, in our own uh, case and that of other eye units um, put more staff into our eye emergency service to cope with that. Uh, and in the meantime, we're looking to get our <clears throat> outpatient services set up properly. Um, in addition, we are putting in new structures and services in around virtual clinics. So people may not be seen the exact same way as they were always seen on going into the future. And by that, I mean, they may get phone calls from the healthcare team. They may set up a video consultation or indeed some will be brought in for a physical uh, review. So we're looking at ways to innovatively deliver all this care so that patients can, can get the correct advice, the correct intervention, but limit the need for them to come physically to the hospital. So this is one of the areas that we'd be looking for the public to cooperate with us on and to understand that if they don't get a physical appointment in the hospital, it does not mean they're not being delivered care. We're just looking to deliver it in a different way so we can manage everybody who needs to be managed uh, and also do it safely. Uh, I think that's a really important point because in reality, um, services will have to be delivered differently um, due to social distancing and um, the needing to, to respect the personal spaces and boundaries so much more. And obviously with the delivery of eye care and um, doing assessments, the individual is so up close with the consultant or um, optician that I'm sure um, new dynamic ways have to be explored. Absolutely. I think when, when our ophthalmic patients come back into our outpatient uh, setting in the years to come, they won't really recognise it uh, from what we always did. We used to have very high volume clinics. There's a lot of patients there. There's a lot of footfall, a lot of activity um, as, as we move people through. We can't do that anymore. Uh, and I can't see those sort of clinics ever coming back. Now, the benefits of that will be um, the time a person will spend in the department. With all those improved flow pathways that the teams are looking at now, people will be giving a dedicated uh, time. Um, their pathway in the department, the number of investigations they're going to need will be predetermined. They will attend for all of those. They'll see their clinician at the end and discharge with a plan. And we will look to do as much as possible in one visit rather than bringing for a test one day and back for a review another day and back for a treatment another day. We're going to look to bundle that activity into as few appointments as possible. So I think patients will end up with a more efficient service. A fewer people will physically attend and we'll manage a lot more over um, virtual uh, consultation platforms. And I suppose it's just a question of patients adapting to that situation, which will take a little bit of time, of course. Well, um, it will take time and it will take trust. Uh, June. When you have a very different scenario, people will question the quality of their care, who they've seen. Is a video consultation the same as a physical consultation? And we're finding our way in this space then as well. But we are setting a clear criteria 
for why somebody would be a vir virtual video consultation versus a physical consultation and to trust the teams that they were dedicating a lot of time and effort to doing this properly. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, I suppose on a, on a separate note, do you think that because the COVID-19 lockdown, some cases of eye conditions would have gone undetected or now have been delayed in getting a diagnosis or treatment, and this could have led to some irreparable damage being done? Like the worst case scenario is an individual going blind sooner. We have a real concern about this, and I note myself, any of the retinal detachments I've repaired during the COVID-19 lockdown period have all presented as what we call macula off retinal detachments, so there's a more delayed presentation. Normally, they would have been 50-50 through this period. So we're expecting some chronic detachments to present after Monday when people go attend their optometrist or indeed attend us directly, and other conditions such as macular degeneration. These concern us the most because that's irreversible vision loss. Other conditions such as um, cataract uh, can be dealt with down the line and will restore uh, good vision for these patients. Obviously, they'll have to manage with um, the inconvenience of poor vision over that period of time. But we are looking at ways of how we can restart cataract surgery and that safely in the coming months. OK, OK. Um, and when do you think normal outpatient appointments will restart? I think as we alluded to earlier in the call, I, I don't think we're ever going to go back to that outpatient scenario that people are familiar with in an eye hospital uh, setting. So it'll be delivered in a slightly different way, as I say, via video consultation and physical consultation with a view to reducing the number of visits a patient has to make to a hospital uh, and to deliver that care efficiently with as few other people around as possible for that trip. Perfect. Um, and in terms of retinopathy screening, is there any other issues there you'd like to, to highlight? This is another question around all screening services, cancer and diabetic retinopathy screening, but when we'll get back up and running. I think it's important to note that a screening service is to detect pre-symptomatic disease. I think a lot of the effort and, and resources in the health service would be diverted to the symptomatic service. So those patients with vision loss are those patients presenting with uh, uh, breast lumps are um, are suspicious suspicions of bowel cancer uh, during this period of time. Screening will uh, should start back up when it's safe to start screening back up. That we can implement screening at socially distant uh, in a socially distant manner. We're looking at new ways to deliver screening uh, again to deliver that safely and that we can meet all those uh, key criteria. But I stress screening is to pick up pre symptomatic disease. And in this immediate period, we will be focusing on the symptomatic service uh, in that point in time. OK, and then the, the other condition you mentioned there is, is cataracts. Um, when do you think the, the surgery of cataracts will restart? Uh, this is a very important point. There's a lot of patients out there who've got cataract who were waiting for surgery or some are waiting for an appointment to come in. And it's a key question that they'll have is when they'll go back to having cataract surgery. Cataract was deemed non-essential for the large part through this uh, lockdown period. So we've not been doing cataract cases, only exceptionally urgent uh, indications we have been doing. We are looking at ways for how we can recommence cataract surgery, that we can run an efficient uh, high volume service to deal with all the patients that are looking to be done. We're looking at our process from how we book a patient in to their clinic visit and then their treatment on the day. We again, those principles of limiting the number of people in the unit at any one time, speeding up the patient's journey to the unit and that they get their surgery delivered safely and then are seen afterwards. And that follow up visit may no longer be in a hospital. It may be in one of our community locations uh, around the country afterwards. Um, we will get back to cataract surgery. We've got to do that only when it's safe. And we're looking at innovative ways around the surgical technique then as well to minimise the risk to patients and the staff. And can I ask you, Dr. Keegan, on a, um, there would, there would, on a separate note in terms of this week, there was a lot of um, publications around the challenges for people with sight loss abiding by social distancing. Um, and as we know, social distancing is now bec becoming um, the new normal. And I suppose, is there any tips or advice you could offer um, people living with sight loss on how to abide by social distancing or um, even to give pointers to the public that for people with sight loss, it is just a challenge because of individuals being unable to see 
two meters in advance or of course their guide dog can't measure two meters in advance and um, so is there any tips or advice you'd like to give people in in regarding that issue yeah absolutely I, I think it's a really important point again this is where we ask society to be tolerant and kind and helpful so those without sight loss or vision impairment that they lead that piece about trying to create that socially distant environment and be understanding and largely society has been exceptionally understanding and kind to each other throughout this process for those with vision impairment and sight loss all people can do is their best and in around this it's about reducing risk so when people continue to do their best and when i talk to people with vision impairment they have a, a very good sense of their own immediate environment around them in their familiar environment or ho in their homes and that. It's when they go to unfamiliar spaces like shopping centers or supermarkets that that sense is somewhat disrupted. So those around them to, to um, be conscious of people with sight loss and those with sight loss to uh, do their best uh, to manage that and to, to try and amend the normal cues that the clues that they pick up on for um, how far others are away from them to sort of work off those as best they can. And again, as we touched on in the first podcast, is the need for regular hand hygiene for those working and living with people with sight loss to keep those spaces as clean as possible. And then those with sight loss to have hand sanitizer with them uh, at all times. Yeah, I, I think it's a really important point just to kind of reinforce the, the fact that this it's a situation where we have to mutually work together and respect each other's abilities um, to be able to abide by social distancing in, into the future um, and to ensure that those living with sight loss do not feel additionally vulnerable or isolated in, the, in cir circumstances that are totally outside their control. Absolutely, June, I agree. Um, is there any other issues you'd like to, to raise, Dr Keegan, at this point in time? Just to go back to the beginning, we are looking to get back to normal service. Uh, the teams have been working very hard in the hospitals to try and prepare the area so that we can do this uh, reboot of our services safely. Um, the teams will be in touch with you if you're on an ongoing schedule or service. We will get to, <clears throat> we will get to everybody's appointment as soon as possible and to be patient with the teams in the hospitals that are working on your behalf. Perfect, perfect. Well, um, at this point in time, all I can say is uh, many thanks for, for your time and um, we'll issue this podcast um, far and wide to make sure that a lot of your patients and many of the service users of NCBI have access to it and are reassured the fact that um, services are now beginning to, to reopen and are there for them. Great. Thank you very much, Jim. Great. Thanks a million.